Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome. We're very, very pleased to see you here at the third in a series of lectures by the Queen Mary University of London Myland Group and jointly with the House of Lords. And what we're doing with this series of lectures is to celebrate not only 1958, therefore 50 years of Life Peerages Act, but also the fact that women have made such a contribution to the work of the House of Lords, of which you're going to hear a great deal more today. I should also thank um, Her Majesty the Queen for allowing us to use this, the robing room, which is part of the Palace of Westminster. So welcome again. Professor Baroness Young of Hornsey has a long and distinguished career and a curriculum vitae, and it is difficult to convey the, the, the breadth and the variety in, in a short introduction such as this, but I'm certainly going to have a go. Lola Young was the Head of Culture at the Greater London Council, and before that, Professor of Cultural Studies at Middlesex University. She's currently a visiting professor at Birkbeck College. She served on several boards in the arts and voluntary sector and is chair of the British Council Arts Advisory Committee. In 2004, Baroness Young founded Cultural Brokers, an arts and heritage consultancy, and has just finished a major national program of artists' commissions connected with the bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade in the British colonies, which culminated in the international creative forum at the Southbeck Centre in November of last year. Lola Young describes herself as a practitioner, a creative thinker, an educator, an academic, and a writer and a broadcaster. She's also a much-valued colleague and friend. Tonight, she will inform, educate, and entertain us with her lecture, Women's Work in the House of Lords, Culture, Language, and Identity. Baroness Young. Good evening. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for coming along this evening. Before I get to the main body of the talk, I'd just like to say a few words of thanks, um, particularly to um, the Baroness Heyman, the Lord Speaker, Sir Peter Hennessy and the Myland Group for initiating the series, and also to Francis, who is a very good friend and very supportive and has been very helpful in, in the genesis of this piece of work. Um, I'd also like to thank Greg Birch, Gina Page, Julian D, and Ma I'm sorry, Mary Takayanagi for their help and support with um, endless amounts of research and responding to questions. But needless to say, the uh, responsibility for ideas, content, and analysis presented lies firmly with me. Okay. Uh, this year, we're marking three important anniversaries. 90 years since women over the age of 30 were allowed to vote, 80 years since women under the age of 30 achieved the right to vote, and 50 years since the Life Peerages Act, which allowed the cre uh, creation of non-hereditary peerages and, of course, for women to become members of the House of Lords. I'm going to focus on this last pen, the, uh, point, the admission of women to the House of Lords. My thoughts are underpinned by a pretty big central question, which is, how can we improve women's participation and achievements in politics and as leaders? The parliamentary exhibition that marks the passing of the Life Peerages Act 1958 opens in the summer um, of this year. So we might want to ask this question, do anniversaries really matter? Well, I believe some do, because reflecting on the past can give us an opportunity to raise questions and to examine the progress of other or otherwise made since the trigger event occurred. In an article on the admission of women to the House of Lords, Duncan Sutherland notes a number of objections that were routinely put forward to prevent women achieving full political rights, and some of these may be familiar to some of you from contemporary discourse. In summary, these are... One, women are inherently not suited to politics because of their physical and or mental differences to men. Okay, that was an argument put forward. Another one, women's difference makes them a distraction and women would exercise their seductive powers when all men wanted was a bit of peace and quiet in the library. <laughs> even women, number three, even women don't like female political candidates, the evidence of which was that there were so few elected after 1918. And those women MPs that had been admitted were labelled undistinguished and disruptive. And finally, 
Female hereditary peers, well, that would be the thin end of the wedge. Allowing the peeresses a place in the House of Lords could lead to equal rights of succession in other areas. So a whole range of reasons and excuses for uh, not wanting to give women full political rights. Now, several people to whom I've spoken have expressed surprise that women life peers weren't admitted into the House until 1958, within my lifetime. It is just as remarkable, I think, that female hereditary peers were denied access until 1963, because, because of this issue, in 1953, Britain had been unable to sign up to the UN Convention on Women's Rights. But before we think about women's achievements since then in a political sphere, I want to have a brief look at the backdrop against which the Act was passed. So, we have the presence of settlers from Africa, from the Caribbean and from Asia, and the sometimes violent reactions to them, to us, being debated in political circles and on the streets. We had the notion of the teenager, although only just born, it was already inextricably linked with social disorder and the imminent breakdown of society, teddy boys and teddy girls and so on. Women who had been encouraged to work in, for example, munitions, engineering, farming during World War II were now being encouraged to return to the domestic sphere once the war had ended. And internationally, populations were challenging imperialism, challenging colonial rule, campaigning against the tyrannies of apartheid South Africa and Jim Crow USA. Broadly speaking, the generation of women to which I belong was the first to assume that we had a right to higher education and or a job. We didn't all have high levels of aspiration, but at our, at our all-girls school, Parliament Hill School, and we have a contingent from the school this evening, hooray, at our all-girls school, the mischief-making opportunities of geography and biology were infinitely preferable to uh, domestic science and needlework. So, some edited highlights, just to anchor the period. The Wolfenden Report recommended the decriminalisation of homosexuality. The last debutantes to be presented to the Queen emerged from Buckingham Palace. Graham Greene's entertainment, Our Man in Havana, and Ian Fleming's Dr. No were published, presenting two rather different approaches to the world of es espionage. The first of seemingly hundreds of carry-on films came out, Carry On Sergeant, and the relaxed-looking couple in the top left corner repre uh, presented the first ever edition of Blue Peter. The magazine illustrated is the autumn 1958 edition of Man About Town, a kind of forerunner of GQ or FHM. It's noteworthy for an article headlined thus, The Perfect Woman, How to Shut a Woman Up with a Brank, a Scold's Bridal. Well, okay, us Parley Hill girls would not have been interested in such crude ploys as the evocation of medieval torture to keep us quiet, not even in jest, the well-dressed, self-confident, and mentally composed Miss Parliament Hill 1962 was, however, expected to conform to a rigidly monitored school uniform which imported heavily from conventional male dress codes, a shirt, striped tie, a bowler hat, would you believe, and a blazer. Anxieties about women taking up the reins of power in in the House of Lords and elsewhere, manifest themselves in a ver variety of ways. Sometimes a focus on the trivial serves as a useful distraction from more challenging areas. For example, from our archives, in November 1962, the leader of the House received a note raising a number of points relating to PRSs. One of the subject headings was Lady Members of the House Wearing Hats. The note continues... I think that the words, except by permission of the House, in Standing Order 24, lets them out in regard to wearing a hat. I do not think the Standing Order needs amending. You will, however, have noticed that all the life peeresses have recently given up wearing hats in the House. You can almost hear a sigh of relief in the words, thank you, written to the side of the note. Now, there's no suggestion... Uh, that Baroness Ravensdale, pictured here, one of the first four women life peers, wore or wanted to wear this hat in the house. And for those of you who can't see it clearly, there's an exquisite little dog on the top which looks like it has angel wings. It's a, a wonderful confection. But I'm not suggesting, as I say, that she wanted to or did indeed try and wear it in the house. And even I can see that it might somehow be thought a little bit distracting by some. And as we know... Women's dress codes are far more heavily policed than men's are, something women politicians understand all too well. 
witnessed the fuss made over Theresa May's footwear at the 2002 Conservative Party conference. On to language. What should we be called, we women in the House of Lords? Apparently, and I quote from this little note here, the militant women peers in 1970 did not want to be referred to as peeresses. Good for them. But the discussions about what to call women peers went deeper than simply adhering to or straying from centuries-old customs and hierarchies. December 1957, and their lordships are debating constitutional reform. One noble earl turns to, and I quote, that most vexatious question, the inclusion of the ladies, and for my part, I prefer that term to women, after a few metaphorical detours, taking in the prospect of the whole fabric of the house collapsing, fortune-telling gypsies and his experience or lack of it of ladies, the same noble earl continued thus, would it not be wiser to wait for the inclusion of the ladies until we have seen how the reform works and then, if thought proper, take in the ladies? Once they're in, they're in for keeps. <laughs> Digging himself even deeper by the second, he continued... I'm not going to give an analogy at the moment, but if you put a cat in the bag and it does not want to come out, it is not an easy matter to deal with. I said, cat, my lord, my lords, not cats. <laughs> Another earl found women in politics highly distasteful. In general, they are organizing, they are pushing, and they are commanding. For this noble earl, the very thought of a female lady chancellor was horrifying, and enabling women's infiltration of the robust, rational world of male politics was to him encouraging them to, and I quote, eat their way like acid into metal, into positions of trust and responsibility which previously men have held. Thankfully, those peers who supported the reforms were quite clear and much more rational about the point of admitting women. It, it was anomalous, it was counterproductive, and it was ridiculous to try and preserve the House of Lords as an all-male enclave, and as we know, the bill was passed and became law. Images of men's power abound in our culture. Movies are a prime example of how cultural forms promote fantasies of male omnipotence and shape the ways in which we view the world. Sometimes these fantasies are very clearly flagged up to us as such. For example, in Back to the Future series, in Zalig, in Forrest Gump, and so on. They're meant to be fun. But how often is that fun-filled fantasy played out with a woman in the title role? I was vaguely aware of these issues, though not in any kind of ideologically feminist-informed sense in 1979, but one could not help become aware as the prospect of Britain electing its first woman prime minister approached. I recall an actor friend of mine telling me to go and see Alien. It's all good for women. And when I saw the film, I knew what she meant. A whole new realm of possibilities opened up then. The birth of a new kind of female action hero with Ripley in the Alien franchise and later Sarah Connor in the Terminator series. And in the real world, the political leadership of the country in the hands of a woman. Did these events signify real progress for women? It's a complicated matter, progress. Maybe we could discuss that later. Momentous as the, as the election of Margaret Thatcher was, the first woman prime minister ever to be elected um, preceded her by 19 years. Sirimaro Bandaranaike was elected prime minister of Ceylon, now, no, now known as Sri Lanka, in 1960. And today, other countries are some way ahead of the UK with regard to the numbers of elected women members of parliament. Against the odds, perhaps, Rwanda, a country recently emerged from the most horrific period of genocidal conflict, tops the world league table for the highest proportion of women elected to parliament. Specific measures were introduced to achieve this. 30% of parliamentary seats were allocated to women. But far from limiting the numbers of women elected, the target was exceeded by 15 seats. The results of such a bold move put in the shade our attempts to encourage more women to participate actively in politics. Here in the law... Oh, okay. Is that the right one? Here in the Lords? Back? Forward? Sorry. Never mind. Oh, hey. Okay, it's me. I've, I've missed one out. Sorry. Never mind. It's okay. We'll go to this. Uh, yeah, here in the Lords where uh, members are appointed, one might expect there to be rather more women represented, but it's still uh, the fact that we only make up about 20% of peers. We have achieved some success in the assemblies, 
Um, and uh, particularly with Wales, where women make up half the elected members, topping the league table, followed by Scotland with over a third. Again, this was a managed process with strategies such as women-only shortlists and twinning, where party lists must have an equal number of men and women. These were deployed in those instances. We're fortunate to live in an era where, although still uh, very much in the minority, women are being elected to lead their countries. It's of interest to me that although it might be expected that the Scandinavian and other European countries would make the pace in this respect, a number of developing countries have also been trailblazers. Now, being the first woman to hold a specific post or to take on a new role is not virtuous in and of itself, but it can be seen as a useful milestone, although occasionally it can feel a bit like a millstone too. There are plenty of women who have achieved at the highest level who currently sit in the House of Lords, and many of them are here this evening. My selection of notable women is relatively arbitrary, but includes the first black women members in the House of Lords, the first Asian woman member of the House of Lords, the first woman to run a polytechnic, the first black woman attorney general, the first black woman member of a cabinet. <clears throat> These accomplishments are important to many members of our communities who feel marginalised and without a voice. However, one measure of success in this long-haul campaign for equalities would seem to me to be that across the board, it should be the case that it's no longer remarkable that, for example, a disabled person takes on this office or a woman is appointed to that role. That's what we should be aiming for, the kind of everydayness of it, the ordinariness of it. The focus of any appraisal of someone's contributions to political culture should be based on what they say, what they do, and one day we will get to that position, I hope. In the House today, there are women experts on virtually every subject. There are women ministers, shadow ministers, the second woman leader of the House in succession, a woman in the new post of Lord Speaker, a woman convener of the independent crossbench peers, women whips to keep the party members in line, women members and chairs of select committees, subcommittees, and so on and so on. And although there's an expectation or maybe even a fear that women will be confined to promoting women's interests or some kind of common feminist ideological conspiracy, such anxieties have not been borne out according to the research in this area. As for the subjects on which women speak or propose legislation most frequently, that again is a complicated issue. It is likely that women will speak with authority on a whole range of subjects because th these are related to roles which women most often fulfill. Women are more likely to be carers of children, or carers of parents and relatives, professionally and personally, for example. The impact of legislation on people in that position is a subject then about which women might have something productive to say, born of experience. But let's think about that for a moment. First of all, party political affiliation is a far greater determinant of a woman politician's view than her gender. It may well be the case that a woman would feel compelled to fight her corner within the party, but women are no more likely to rebel against the whips than men. Perhaps more importantly, we should switch the emphasis of the question and ask why it is that still that there are so many men who do not take up these issues. Simply because fewer men have a direct experience of full-time child-rearing doesn't it absolve them of these responsibilities or thinking about them. Thankfully, we are seeing more and more men taking a greater role in that area amongst others. And with many women becoming responsible for caring an aging population, with current levels of domestic violence, the failure, the abysmal failure to secure convictions on the vast majority of rape cases and the absolutely appalling recent examples of male violence against women, now more than ever, all of us should be putting our heads together to produce legislation and strategies that will improve the situation. Finally, I want to speak briefly about leadership in general and women. Inevitably, much of what I've said relates to women and their participation in parliamentary politics. But there are numerous ways to make an impact on society if you feel disgruntled, upset about it, from the local to the global and everywhere in between. What matters is to discover and develop a critical voice. If we look back on past struggles, we can see that alliances and support networks are important. Crucially, so is being armed with knowledge. Mary Robinson's work is interesting in this respect. She is chair of Women World Leaders, which seeks to support a more collaborative style of leadership and offer support to women leading their countries. Robinson also aims to link women with power to women with determination working on the ground. She says, and I quote, 
The passion, strength, and power of women to make change at grassroots level is always underestimated. Connecting to power from a grassroots level also informs the leadership initiative shortly to be launched by the Young Foundation. The Uprising project will support and develop young leaders, women and men, initially from East London boroughs, eventually from across the country. In the 1980s, many black and Asian women and white working class women felt alienated from what was perceived as as the white middle class nature of the women's movement of feminism. And that still holds true for many today, perhaps more so in some respects. But the prize of women's liberation should not be seen in isolation from freedom, from hunger, from anti-racism, social deprivation and environmentalism. For me, feminism is a much more holistic way of thinking than fighting simply, although it's important, than fighting simply for equal pay or against the objectification of women. The scale of the project is huge, it's daunting, but I think of myself as a pragmatic idealist and know it will be several lifetimes before we reach something approaching equality. After all, in this, our mature, stable democracy, we've still got another 10 years to go before we can even celebrate just 100 years of women over the age of 30 being allowed to vote. Thank you. I mean, yes, Um, but actually, before I go to that, I really would like to ask maybe some specific questions to the people here, particularly some of the younger women who are here this evening. As I said to you earlier, there are some girls here from Last Swap, which used to be called Parliament Hill in my day, and there's some girls here also from John Kelly, John Kelly Girls, and from Hornsey School for Girls. And I'm really interested in what some of them might uh, want to say. So I'm giving them a little bit of time to think that through, and hopefully one or two of them will, will um, even if it means asking your teacher to, to ask the question, will say something. So I think it's really um, important for you to think about some of these things. But um, as regards women in, in the House of Lords, you know, by House of Lords standards, which is kind of like geological time, I've just a little sort of baby thing. I've only been here for four years. Um, But what I do see is that I thought there were masses of women in the House of Lords. And what I realized was that women actually attend better on the whole than their male counterparts. Um, um, There are a great deal of women on the front benches. Some of the images that I was showing you earlier showed the women who are spokespeople for their party on a whole range of issues. Yes, education and health, but other areas too. So women have made a huge impact in that respect, I think, in the House of Lords. Questions? Yes, indeed. Oh, there's a mic coming there, Linus Whittaker. Oh, I can Whittaker. shout. Thank you. I wondered if some of the school students present who will have much more understanding of this than any of us older folks could say, do the boys who are at school, do they want to see more influential women, more women in public life, more women running schools, running things? What do the boys think? Because if we don't get the boys to change, it's hard to see any change. Uh, um, Hi, I'm from John Kelly, and I was just wondering, on your presentation, you included Britain as a 42nd country, 42nd country to have, uh, uh, apparently 19% of the the workers were women, and I was thinking that's not the most, I mean, uh, Sweden and uh, Finland and other countries are more. Okay, yeah, um, but that table, sorry, some of these images whiz by very quickly. I think the table to which you're referring was the one where uh, Britain was number 47 in the league table in terms of the number, uh, the proportion of elected women um, um, in the Houses of Parliament. Well, um, yeah, um, Rwanda was number one, as I said, which I think was very interesting. And then, as you might expect, the Scandinavian countries come next. 
Of course, there are loads of countries after us because we're 47 and there's 184 in that sample. But that doesn't really excuse us from sort of thinking about how we need to change that, particularly as it seems almost as if, you know, numbers shot up at a certain moment and then they kind of leveled off. So what is it that's putting uh, women off from, from participating in the political life? Question there. Okay, would you like to take the mic? Thank you. What do you think women will be doing in 20 years' time? Mm. You mean, do, you mean, you, do you mean specifically in politics or just kind of generally? Generally. Gosh. <laughs> you started with the easy question. I don't know. I mean, I think, what can I say? 20 years' time. I can't even I don't, say that's 2028. I can't even... Th it's really hard for me to think. When you get to my age, it's quite hard to think that far forward. Um, I don't know, because the rate of change is a peculiar thing, and it's sort of related to that question I was saying about progress. It, we expect progress to be a linear thing, so that you expect to be able to say, well, in 50 years' time, we can quantify how such and such a thing is different. But in fact, it doesn't quite work that like that. And it never works universally. I can say that we were the first generation to expect to go out to work and, and have a higher education. There'd be loads of women from my generation who had no such expectation whatsoever. So it's really hard to generalise in, in that kind of uh, way about what the great mass uh, of women will be doing. What I hope they'll be doing is working towards this situation where we've improved matters for so many women both here and around the world and people. Okay, all the questions are coming from the young people. I'll just ask one more question. I know I feel like John Kelly Girls is dominating here, the questions. Um, Lynette Kamala, the Vice Principal of John Kelly Girls. I just wondered what words of inspiration could you perhaps give to some of our girls here, particularly the younger ladies who are present, which they can take back with regards to what's inspired you to continue and to actually um, achieve and to be in this position today? What key tips could they take from your journey, in a way? I know it's, again, quite a tricky <laughs> question. Uh, well, I suppose what I'd say is that um, I guess people take their inspiration from all kinds of quarters, and um, I would um, say that, you know, sometimes it's just about having really good mates around you, Some, and, and people who kind of encourage you, don't put you down and sort of tell you you shouldn't be doing this, you're only a girl, or you shouldn't be doing that. That's not what people from your background do. I think the thing is, yeah, is if I had one thing to say, it's about not accepting limitations that other people impose upon you. If you're going to limit yourself, do it from a position of knowledge and from choice and recognition of what you can do, but not to let other people say, you can't do that. So many people told me the things I couldn't do uh, when I was young, and it's, it's not helpful. Thank you. And there's somebody down here, and then there's somebody at the back. There's loads. Um, as the table showed, there, were, there aren't that many women in politics at the moment, but what do you think can be done to encourage young women to come into politics? Well, maybe you could answer that for me. I mean, you know, would, is that something that you would consider as a career? Is that something you'd, you'd think about doing? Yeah. And, and what, what's made you think that, that that is something you'd like to pursue? Um, because when you look at politics, you just see, like, I don't know about, I, I know about some people of my generation, but um, you just see, like, middle-aged men and you just think, you, they don't represent our views and they don't represent, like, my friends' views. So I don't think it's a fair representation of our country's views. So in terms of, sorry, I just want to pursue this a little bit more. So in terms of, okay, that's what you want to do. How is it you're going to set out to achieve that? And can you bring along some of your friends with you? Well, um, I know that some are already involved, but mm. I wouldn't necessarily know it's just safe for me, but... I definitely try and do something about it. Well, I think, you know, here is, can be a place of inspiration. And as I say, there are a number of, of, of peers and possibly MPs here tonight, I don't know. But there are a number of women here tonight who you might want to talk to. And certainly we have visits, we have a school outreach program. So in terms of um, teachers who are here this evening and want to get in contact with um, the Lord Speaker's uh, outreach program for schools, please, please make yourselves known after the session. Thank you. Shall we go over there? <coughs> people there and then there's less people. Um, how do women feel about reforming the House of Lords when they've only just recently been allowed peerages? Well, yeah, recent, 
It's relatively recently. I suppose, um, actually, you know what? We have this great thing called the Women Peers Room. And um, it's a really good place to go. If I could just say, you know, in the House of Lords, things aren't quite as um, tense and fraught between the political parties as they sometimes are in the House of Commons. And I think there's quite a lot of opportunity for women to sort of help each other out and to, you know, keep each other uh, uh, going here. Um, sorry, does that answer your question? No. What did you, sorry. Reform. Is that what you said? Reform. Sorry. I had a heavy cold. I couldn't hear you probably. So you want to know about reform in the House of Lords? Oh, okay. Oh, gosh. Well, the debates about reform have gone on for almost as long as, uh, as, uh, as the House of Lords uh, have been around. I think, um, again, it's a difficult one. And it's not just about a, women, a woman's view on that particular issue, I, is what I would say, um, I guess, um, uh, to try and be a bit more concise about it. It's not just a woman's view on what the House of Lords should be. It's, and it's not actually even necessarily a party political thing. There are just, we're just trying to find a way of making it work um, differently to the way it works now. Sorry, it's slightly confused and rambling. Else here, I think. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I wanted to ask if as a black woman and coming up and getting into House of Lords and like that, have, have you faced a lot of prejudice? Um, well, I think uh, those of us who are black and some of those who are white will know absolutely that that's kind of part and parcel of your life. But, again, what I would say is that... <sighs> You know, you can't let that determine what you do and, and make you into something that you don't want to be. And I know it feels, you might think, oh, well, it's easy for her to say that because she's doing whatever she does. But, you know, there are moments, I could give you loads of examples um, um, that have happened here and, you know, in, in my working and, and personal and professional life. But, you know, I just think you've got to... Um, Try and draw strength from the fact that you know that they're wrong, uh, that the people who perpetuate those views will have had their day in some point in the future, and it will, you know, we will kind of conquer that kind of attitude. And you also have to be pretty secure and know your history, um, draw whatever you can from education, even when that seems to be running counter to some of the things you want to achieve. It's really about sort of trying to determine your own path, not ignoring what's outside, absolutely acknowledging that, but really trying to keep your eyes on the prize, as Americans say. <coughs> yes. Oh, thank you. <coughs> oh, sorry, would you like to wait for the... Um... Thank you. Yeah. One day there'll be a, an elected House of Lords, hopefully. So, what, what, what would you think this, uh, um, at some point? Um, can you expand on um, on all women's shortlists? It's it's quite it's very controversial. Mm. There was that incident in Wales not long ago. Um, Blanagh Gwent, I think. Um, mm. Yeah. Can you, can you expand on all women's shortlists? Is that democratically justifiable, uh, you know, etc.? <coughs> well, I guess you know. Intuitively, I hate the idea of quotas and, um, you know, forcing people into doing things in a particular way, especially based on numbers, because I think there's a limit to what the way in which we can work with numbers, uh, uh, what we can do. But there is... And, and the other thing is that, OK, what you do then is you have a society where, to use a kind of shorthand, institutionalised sexism and racism and all the rest of it, so what you do is then say, oh, okay, well, let's now invent loads of structures and processes to mitigate the effects of these structures and processes which we set up over here to do this other thing. It just seems slightly odd to me, bizarre, actually. So, and, and I think Siv Nandan, who um, uh, set up the Institute of Race Relations, used to put it like this. Um, you know, uh, it's like you're breaking somebody's leg and then you give them a crutch. Um, stop breaking the legs. That is, that is the point. So if people would say, 
if the gatekeepers and guardians of the party political lists would change their mindset, then we wouldn't have to have this discussion. What is going to you tell me again? I come back to you. You tell me what is going to change the situation. What is going to change this dire, slightly dire situation we have in terms of the low, lowish proportions of women participating in, in, in parliamentary uh, politics? And it, it, actually, there's a similar debate around black caucusing and um, all black lists and so on. These are very complicated and difficult sets of um, arguments to get to grips with. But, and as I say, in a way it would see, seem so much simpler not to do that, not to keep breaking people's legs, as I say. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I'm 24. I run my own charity in Africa, and I run the National Business Programme for the Prince's Trust. I feel like I've come a long way in my short career, but I've really got a long, long way to go. But I want to do it because I'm me. Not because I'm a woman and people are going to open doors for me or I'm going to be there to balance the figures. And I'm really looking forward to the fight. Some of what you're saying makes me feel like I should, I should think of myself as a victim, but I don't. No, Is I, that what you're saying? No, not in the slightest. No, 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 no. I'm sorry if I've miscommunicated that. Not in the slightest. And I think this has been one of the great sort of misperceptions of the, the take that I have on feminism. It's not about victimhood at all. Women can be victimised just as anybody can be victimised, but you can refuse to take on that status of victim, and that's absolutely the position from which I come. What I say to you is you have to recognise, and it's very interesting, and I hope this doesn't sound patronising, but a lot of research shows that when you talk to women, young women, it's when they hit the age of 35, 40, that sometimes they think that kind of view, you know, something switches on when they look at their male count counterparts and see the kind of recognition that they've got, when they see the gap in their pay uh, for doing roughly similar jobs and, and so on and so forth. Rep as I say, representation to me is not about tick boxing, but it is about saying, wait a minute, unless we want to say there's something, there is something mentally and physically wrong with women that prevents them from participating in, in the political process, and therefore maybe we just shouldn't bother with all of these kind of positive actions or even having this discussion. If you think that, then that's one thing, and that, then you can kind of let it lie, really. But if you think, well, actually, because of the kinds of experiences that a lot of women have, which in my view are very much about culture, very much about nurture rather than nature, because of those kinds of experiences, a lot of women are able to speak about specific things and those voices need to be heard. And if you think about it in terms of, I know it's basic and can sound kind of sexist in a different way, but a lot of women do have responsibility uh, for the home. I read this interesting thing the other day. You may know that you know, there's a kind of um, a growth in men uh, staying at home, house husbands. And I read this article which was talking about these sort of 100,000 men across the country who are doing this now. And you know what was interesting? Some of them said they still expected the woman to come home and do the ironing when she got in from work. And it's like trying to say, look, you know, that's a relatively trivial, trivial thing, but it's trying to say, look, what do we mean when we talk about equality? You've got to do your bit as well. And I mean that in the biggest sense rather, as well as the, the smaller sense. So I'm not at all about being... Um, a victim or about trying to be a pretend man or, you know, trying to do things to fit into other people's um, idea of what me and others should be. Absolutely, I want to be taken on because people have thought, oh, she's really good for that. Uh, not because we need a black person here. Oh, and she's a woman as well, so we can get two for one. I don't want to be thought of in that way at all. You know, I want to be there because I'm good. But at the moment, we haven't quite reached the point where we can say... You know, we've done the deal. Um, I kind of have two questions, so I kind of hope that's okay. Um, oh. Can we just have the gentleman here first? And then we'll come okay. Back. I don't know where the microphone is. Where's the microphone gone? Sorry. Oh. Uh, but we need we need it to be recorded. I think. As a middle-aged man, obviously, and also an ironer, and no problem. 
I found your lecture absolutely fascinating, brilliant overview, but I love the way you <coughs> challenge some of the younger members of the audience to answer a question. Possibly, as an ex-politics teacher and head of careers, I could give them some advice. And I don't know whether it's got anything to do with 50 years of women now being members of the Lords. But as what I do now as a headhunter for the not-for-profit sector, there is absolutely no doubt if women want to be politicians, they've got to achieve something, as men do, as everybody has to do. And one of the ways to do it, and it's perfectly ethical and it's businesslike, is to go in and run organisations. Is this still on? I thought I was being shut up. Um, um, We've got a scolds bridle it, for you, don't worry. It's, in my professional life, I can absolutely demonstrate outstanding women on shortlists who get the top job. Mm. And they get it because they're good, they're strategic, and they've got other skills. So that may be as a route for some of our younger colleagues here. Do you, do you think that's going to work through the system? I work in the cultural sector, and it's really interesting to me that um, within, um, let's say, for example, um, the museums sector and the larger arts organisation, there's a whole... Women are in a majority in the lower and middle-ranking roles, but you could virtually name the number of women running those large national, national organisations on the fingers of, you know, a couple of hands... So there is, it does take time to come through, I know that. It takes time. But what was very, very, and, and I can think of women on short lists for big art jobs at the moment, what was very <coughs> interesting in the graphics that you put up, nearly all of your colleagues either came into the Lords because of proven success in charities or have been associated as volunteers, mm. and I think that's very interesting indeed. Mm. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Hi. Um, I went to Parliament Hill for about, like, I'm still at it, and um, <laughs> so about eight years or so, and I studied feminist history quite a lot. They kind of drill it into you from about the age of 14, and you do it about every year minus year 10, so I'm told, though I don't remember it like that. And um, most of the girls that I did it, and even some of the boys who did it in their schools, they find feminist history really boring. Do you think the education system could change, and if so, how? Because... Labour keeps pumping out stuff that is not very um, edit edifying for young girls who want to know their history in an interesting way. Mm. Well, one thing to say, my immediate reaction to that one thing to say is that, you know, um, in our day at Parley Hill, I mean, the idea that there was, you know, there was one history and that's all you did. So the idea now that you can do different kinds of histories or even that different histories exist is actually quite exciting to somebody like me who never had that opportunity but I take your point and I think you know it relates to a whole <coughs> excuse me <coughs> a whole range of issues about how we teach what we think of as being education how we ask young people to learn um, the content of the work the methodology and so on and I know teacher, teachers have had to struggle with a huge um, uh, curriculum, with targets and testing, and young people being tested, in my view, until all the interest in education has been kind of taken from them. Um, it is really, really difficult. I haven't got any quick kind of answers uh, for you on that. Um, but I suppose the kind of big long-term answer is something needs changing. Who's going to do it? We can say... Something needs changing, but it's not up to me. It's somebody else's job. But somebody has to do that. Somebody has to make the case. Somebody has to make the arguments. I hope now that there's actually a number of um, fora being developed for young people who are interested in taking um, an active role in community and, and, and in society um, in general. And maybe sort of making your voice heard through those kinds of um, uh, fora would be something to do. But I, I appreciate it's really difficult. Um, as the head of history at Parliament Hill, I would just like to refute everything that she's just said. <laughs> um, and they do not have feminist history 
falls down their throats. But we do teach women's history because we think it's very, very important that they do have some contextual understanding. But one of the things that I would like to say is a concern for me in my job and has increased over the last few years is the number of students who teach, female students, who say, I'm not a feminist and have a very, very negative image of what a feminist is. And I have this sinking feeling that the agenda has been hijacked and that there is this view that, that feminists are ugly women who want to live on a separate island from men and that it's very hard sometimes to reclaim that from girls and to make it seem a legitimate idea for discussion for them. And we are working through that at school, but it, it can be quite hard. I agree. I don't know if any of you sort of over the age of 30 know who this young woman is here in this uh, picture. You know who it is. Who is it? Absolutely. Ellen Page, the star of a, real, um, a recent hit film called Juno, rave reviews. I think she was Oscar nominated or something. She said the other day, I'm a feminist. What's the problem? Get over it. You know, what is the big deal? And I think you're absolutely right. You know, the, oh God, where should I start? You know, in the 70s, there was a particular brand of, one might say, radical feminism, where people were really pushing the boundaries. And it did have some of the elements that you speak of. So what happened in very sort of generalised terms, particularly in the media, which, especially at that point, extremely male-dominated, big threat. So what do you do when a big threat comes towards you? You ridicule it, you put it down, you try to humiliate people. Just as, you know, it still goes on today. So if you speak out against something which seems to undermine the status quo, then that's the treatment you get. And, you know, to young women who say, I'm not a feminist, first of all, you're only able to say that because some of us actually were feminists and still are feminists. And, you know, all of those women that you've seen on the screen tonight and from the past whom you haven't seen have been out there fighting for your rights. Think about, if you'd have said that, you know, 90 years ago, I'm not a feminist, what does it matter if women get the vote or not? You wouldn't be here you know, you've got to take these issues up. It doesn't matter in, to some extent whether you call yourself a feminist or not. It's about what you do with the um, power and the potential power that you do have. But um, I'm, you know, I'm a feminist. Hey, you know, it's not that frightening. <laughs> and um, just do it and be it. I think we have time actually for one more question, and I think there's a hand there. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm well. I'm I'm from Camden Council, and I'm part of my cam I'm part of Camden Youth Council, and I'm a co-leader. And being black and male, and of working class background, I feel I'm disadvantaged and marginalised in the same sort of sense that you're talking about women being marginalised in in politics. So what I wanted to ask you is that if you feel that's the case, do you not feel that women like yourself? and others, like myself and others, should, try, should actively go out to places where the marginalised are and try and s simplify politics to them to get them involved because do you not feel that politics is being geared towards a set group of people and the sort of language and the sort of phrases and tones that are being used, most people do not understand them and if you do feel that, how would you address it? Well, um, okay, you know, I hate the kind of thing that says, here's the hierarchy, you know, if you're a black disabled woman, you've got more points than if you, you know, are male and working class or what have you. So let's sort of get rid of that idea for a start, I think. I think, but having said that, what I feel is that, you know, we should be working together and forming alliances and developing the kind of understanding which allows us to say... Okay, I recognise your predicament. Um, it has some features which I recognise in what is my predicament some of the time. I'm not wholly determined by my race and gender. But I recognise some of that, and here's what we need to do to change. Sometimes what we need to do to change can only be done by people speaking in a certain way and with certain networks of power. And the thing is to try and get some of us into those networks and see what they can do. So th those networks and those ways of thinking aren't going to disappear overnight. So we have to think of ways in which we do them. But we also need people to be really cross and fed up and to say in terms which make sense to them and the people 
um, uh, um, uh, who are around them, you know, this is what we want in plain and simple language. To me, as I, say, as I said earlier, it's not about saying, oh, you know, can I please join this victims group? It's about saying, well, here, there are some little gaps, there are some chinks in the armour, and if we can sort of infiltrate, eat away like acid, into these um, um, plates of armour, then we can make some progress. But, uh, you know, there are different languages, and we, in a, there's a level on which we need to be multilingual. Can I just take this opportunity to tell you that the fourth lecture in this series is going to be given by Baroness James, better known to you perhaps as P.D. James, the crime writer, on Thursday the 1st of May, and I'm sure um, you, obviously you can apply for tickets. Can I also take the opportunity here again to thank warmly um, the Myland Group, uh, Peter Hennessy and the Lord Speaker for initiating, both of them initiating and supporting this lecture series which have become, become increasingly well attended and of course I would like very much to thank all of you for coming and for your extremely interesting and enlightening questions but most of all what I need to do is to thank Baroness Young for having so wonderfully informed and entertained us in equal measure. <laughs>